All right. Hey, William, how's it going? Hi. Oh my God, I had never been on the other side, so actually, I thought, do they have an announcement? They usually say that you're being recorded. Oh, you're you're being recorded. I know. I saw. I saw it, but oh, but I, I usually hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've never done this before, but I'm really excited, and yeah. I'll tell you about what tea I'm drinking. I'm drinking mm -hmm. out of this amazing Land Rover mug. <laughs> I'm amazing. <laughs> I don't own a Land Rover, but I have a mug. I don't even have a mug. I'm borrowing it from somebody. I am drinking Celestial Seasoning. Ooh. Vermont Maple Ginger. Ooh. Now, I don't have my tea stash with me, as I yeah. know, like, or my handmade tea bowls with me, but yeah. we're making do. So what are, you, what are you drinking? Well, I am in honor of uh, being in the South. I'm making sweet tea. I'm drinking sweet tea. I lower the sugar content. It's basically just Lipton, at water, and sugar. <laughs> Amazing. I always love, when I lived in Memphis, I always loved sweet tea. Yeah. But like the way you say it, it's not just sweet tea, but you kind of roll it all together. It's sweet tea. tea. Yeah, exactly. It's good for fried chicken. Unfortunately, I don't know fried chicken. For sure. And fried pickles, which are mm -hmm. also really good. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. up here in Minnesota, no sweet tea, or at least not here in Afton, Minnesota, where I am right now, no sweet tea, but Vermont maple ginger is the thing. Could you go pick some? Pick some sweet tea? No, like uh, herbal tea. Oh, oh, you, I'm sure I could pick some herbs. I yeah. Could. I'm still exploring this. Lovely you know what I've learned in Portland is that they use the tip of spruce and they make this really lovely tea in the spring, actually around now. Oh, that's, I can imagine that would be really good. Yeah, it has awesome. a really yeah, lovely- a of pine kind of flavors yeah. and scents. That would be really lovely. It's very light, and it's very lemony. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was very refreshing, I actually miss it. That sounds really good. Yeah, so good. seek it out, make sure you know what you- I pick. totally will. <laughs> and, well, it's, you know, it's funny weather right now. Yeah. It was snowing this morning mm -hmm. and then it was sunny and then it started snowing again and now it's sunny again yeah I guess this is what springtime is like in yeah Minnesota, was yeah that area um and speaking of spring mm -hmm. our topic today is flowers yes spring um and i'm really excited to look at flowers with you so yeah. do, do you want to start or do you what do you what do you want or do you want me to start it's up to you whatever i can start you can why don't you or... start Okay, all right, I'll start. Okay. Um, so I thought uh, when uh, Chris, uh, uh, Kristen invited me to do this and she was suggesting uh, flowers as topics, uh, can you see the uh, I screen? See flowery I'm... messages. Yeah. Amazing. And I thought, yeah. Uh, so I thought of there's so many different ways to approach this, but <clears throat> I wanted to really only focus on one or two works that really drives home sort of uh, spring flower that highlights spring flowers, but also uh, have a, let's say, salacious sort of punch. Mm -hmm. So I thought this is sort of a little fun and something flowery for us to look at, especially now we're all cooped up inside, uh, you know, remind us that spring is happening. Uh, flower painting, of course, has a long history. Uh, so I'm an art Chinese art historian, so a lot of my work will be Based in China, uh, flowers, of course, have a long history in China, in visual cultures and paintings and in sort of decorative arts. But the flower, two flower paintings I'm going to really focus on were produced uh, in the court of the Southern Song, which <coughs> uh, after they were sort of kicked out of the north, they were based in what is today Hangzhou, uh, in the southern city of Hangzhou. Uh, it's a small court, but it's a very vibrant court, especially in terms of the visual and literary culture. The, uh, the, here is a sort of image of the main figure I want to talk about. So uh, this is a slide that I'm only mainly sort of give you a, you a sense uh, of the necessary information that you need before I dive into these two paintings. The Southern Song Court of China, 1127 to 1279, uh, very short period until uh, it was finally extinguished by the Mongols, the Yuan. Uh, the 
painter who painted this, uh, these two paintings was the painter Ma Yuan. Uh, in Chinese, the last name always comes first. So Ma is the same last name as my last name. Ma Yuan, he was a uh, academic court painter. Uh, and his works are generally sort of in the service of the Southern Soul Court. And the third person that's important, perhaps the most important figure in all of these two paintings is the figure Empress Yang, who was also known as Yang Meizi. Uh, Yang Meizi is actually, uh, for a long time, they, wasn't, they weren't sure if Yang Meizi and Empress Yang were the same person, but scholars have proved that they were the same person because Yang Meizi is a very uh, common diminutive way of calling somebody, basically calling uh, little sister Yang, right? Uh, is a very endearing term. So they weren't sure if it's actually who would be uh, in a position to call her that. And of course, the answer would be probably her husband, <laughs> Emperor Lingzong. Uh, uh, at least these are sort of in the records. So on the right, you actually have a portrait, a formal portrait of Empress uh, Yang herself, uh, probably done uh, after her death. Uh, so of course, she's a much older woman. But when the two paintings were painted, she is still in her 40s. So it's still a very beautiful, very young woman, uh, per se. Let's go into looking at the flower paintings. The two flower paintings are both depicting. I want uh, to ask a question. Yes, now. yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know this is a way to ask questions later, but can we just go back to that last picture? Because it's so yeah. interesting to me. I just. What is she wearing on her head? Yes, <laughs> yes. That should be so incredible. I'm just, I'm really digging the entire ensemble. Yeah. There, are those little birds on her robe? Um, they are little birds, little pheasants, the pairs of pheasants on her robe. On her head is actually a dragon crown. Later on, it would be turned into phoenix crown because phoenix is usually associated yeah. with the female imperial family. Oh, I, but, see the, I see the, yes. head, the face there, that mm -hmm. sort of, that's I guess mm -hmm. the dragon's head that's popping yeah. out there. Yeah, that's and then these sort of little sort of little, I guess, appendages uh -huh. uh, that comes off, they're in the shape of clouds. So this whole headdress, which is done in gold, silver, finial, with uh, most likely the bluish green, they're kingfishers feather that were used to color them with, of course, different gems, pearls, of course. I'm guessing this is a ruby. Uh, so the whole effect is as she moves, everything so, sort of vibrate, yeah, especially these sort of wings, probably. like shimmers and vibrate, right? Cool. So uh, it would have been an incredible effect and these would have been formal sort of court. Uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, costumes and jewelry as well. I love that. And then I'm guessing, I mean, to my to my sort of textile fanatic eyes, mm -hmm. the it looks like she's got a kasa or something on the um, covering the throne, right? Covering the chair. Yeah. yeah, or, yeah, yeah we don't yeah. know exactly what kind of textile, but it's right. to right. those kind of throne covers that you see. I think, I think kasa would be very likely choices. Uh, there's actually a lot of example in uh, the Yuan Dynasty, which is the Mongol dynasty that uh, conquered them, uh, the examples of these uh, made out of wool that were clear copies of these type of textile in uh, okay. Central Asia, actually. Uh, so yeah, everything is sort of fabulous. Lots of flowers there too. Lots of flowers, <laughs> lots of peonies. Always in the textiles. Lots of right, flowers. right. And all of them have specific meanings and I'm not going to, I won't have time to go into all the meanings of them. Yeah. All of the symbolic messages, which uh, which is also what I won't go get into because flowers themselves have specific auspicious uh, messages within China. Um, you know, I can certainly do a whole uh, lecture about just like going on about sort of peonies symbolizes oh, prosperity and all of that. <laughs> uh, but I also think that's kind of boring. Uh, to be fair. Oh, no, no, no. You can look it up in a dictionary. Right? Fair enough. So, um, but it's so much more fun when you tell me. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I will get into a little bit of that. The two flower paintings are actually very simple. Uh, they're very sort of uh, uh, straightforward flower paintings. Paintings of flowers you would encounter in early springs around now, or even actually even earlier, probably in February, of uh, apricot blossom in this case. Uh, you will also see peach blossom, or, and then sometimes plum blossom. There's several variations. All of these paintings are also very small. They are uh, maybe slightly larger than what you can see on your computer screen right now. Hmm. 
So they're very delicate, they're very small paintings. Uh, that already automatically tells you perhaps the intended audience is not a public audience, but something more private. Um, we also see that them, uh, they were also done as a sort of collaboration. They are collaborations uh, of uh, the painter Ma Yuan, who painted the flower, the branch of uh, apricot blossom, and the empress herself, who is also a co-author of uh, this artistic creation. She's the one who wrote the beautiful two lines of calligraphy on the upper right-hand corner. And in fact, this is one of the, her characteristics that made uh, Empress uh, Yang such a favorite of the empress because of her calligraphic skills and her uh, knowledge of history. So she is very well educated uh, and uh, within, um, which is fairly unusual even for uh, ladies of a high status in the court at the time. Um, I just want to briefly talk a little bit about the composition because Ma Yuan is such a sort of unique, uh, his composition is so recognizable and so influential, uh, is that note that the branch sort of starts off in the lower left-hand corner and then sort of meander away its way toward the center and then finally spreading in this sort of spread eagle or sort of a, a sort of uh, V-shape tour, by the way, pointing tour the two lines of calligraphy. Right? So this way of composition is very much characteristics of Ma Yuan's composition. For example, the one on the right that you see is in another work by Ma Yuan <coughs> for the court. Uh, at the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, it was a fan painting that is now collected in an album reef. You also see a very similar compositional strategy, starting in the lower left-hand corner, and then a branch, in this case, also a plum blossom, a plum tree, spreading uh, is sort of very cragged, very angular, age-looking uh, branches toward the upper right-hand corner, toward the moon in this case. Uh, so they take on almost dragon-like or sort of a lifelike type of appearance in terms of the branches. The poetry and the type of works depicted here belongs to a genre of a sort of poetry called Yongwu, which is this form of poetry that celebrates a inanimate things. Um, <clears throat> uh, well, I guess it includes animals too, so animals and things. Um, they, and there are these sort of close studies of these uh, things through uh, visual imageries, but also through poetry. So let's actually look at the two lines of poetry, which are, you know, fairly simple. Receiving the wind, she presents her beauty. Moistened with dew, she reveals her charm. Presumably the feminine uh, sort of representation is the plump, uh, the apricot blossom here but yet could easily be translated into uh, reading it as Empress Yang herself. And remember, these are private sort of images. They're probably only meant for her husband, Emperor Li Zong. And so I, yeah. Been like in an album or just as a, a loose leaf painting, how would, how would the emperor or the empress have seen this originally? Um, so I have not seen this in real life, um, so, but many of these are collected in album leaves. But the album leaves, many of them are sort of dispersed, so we actually don't have a clear context of what the original album okay. would have been. But never like hung on a wall or no. no, 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 no. The small size too, again, is they some, right, sometimes right. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. And that also lends itself to sort of the poetry, the interaction between the poetry and writing, sort of writing these sort of intimate messages, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I'm not, so, so I think the message here, I think, and of course, I'm also purposely using the color red to suggest that, you know, I think the message is also very clear from the Empress to her husband is that basically I am still beautiful, <laughs> even in my 40s, which was pretty, uh, uh, it's pretty, uh, it's past her reproductive age in, in 12th century. Uh, well, I think you didn't know officially after Right. Five, <laughs> right. Five, but, but I think this is also a, a, a un, one, one could see this as a very subtle message, but I, for me, uh, perhaps not as subtle, but really sort of this idea, the, emo the action of opening up a sort of flower as in welcoming the duo, the sort of... Uh, 
too. And it's very sexual, right? And uh, so, I mean, and also this idea, this emphasis on fertility and fecundity mm -hmm. is very clear too uh, on the painting itself. Uh, and by the way, note that the painting is deliberately created so that every angle of the branch and every angle of the flowers are revealed. And this is part of the yeah. characteristic of your rule of studying and celebration of objects. Note that every stages of a fruit and a flower's life is there. The young bud, the, the flower in fully blossom, uh, and the flower that uh, is, have fallen, have lost all of these petals, right? Um, <clears throat> getting ready, pregnant, and to bear fruits. So I think, uh, I, I think to sort of comparing to her that I had children, but I can potentially have still more children. I'm still potentially beautiful and sensual as an incredible role yeah. here. Right? Does when in would the empress have more power in the court? Is she absolutely, especially uh, the power of a woman in, in the 12th century in China is definitely relied on what not only the number of heirs that she can provide, the number of children that she can provide, but the number of male heirs she can provide. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, and the same similar type of message is also made even also clear here in another painting, very similar composition as we can see, of course, the other, now is on the other corner. Um, and, on, and all of these sort of branch are not uh, craggly, but rather fairly erect, uh, giving you a, a sense of, I think, Ma Yuan's close uh, observation of some of these uh, different type of flora uh, in nature. Uh, the poem reads, it takes a thousand seasons to conceive a seed but all resulting from the spread of blossom in the second month. The spring is also seen as a time for regeneration and uh, mating, uh, sort of sex sexual ma uh, matings and things like that. So I think the message here is very similar to the previous message. It's also very clear uh, to the husband, that of Emperor Mizong, that uh, <clears throat> her viability and her fecundity and attractiveness using these sort of flower images as a metaphor. Yeah. Fabulous. So, that's all I have. These are amazing. No, this is a perfect segue too to the yeah. I want to show. Um, I love, I love these. I love also yeah. the sort of way in which the apricot blossom is sort mm -hmm. of anthropomorphized in the yes. text, right? It becomes yeah. a feminine um, yeah. agent. I love that. Um, yeah. So shall I show? I'm going to show you my images. Okay. And, um, let's see how I do this. Can I do that? Yeah, let's just continue. Oops, go right there. Can we do that? Let's share that. All right. And yep, great. This is the start. Here we go, flowers. All right, so I had, I had other cheesy names. But I <laughs> flowers. <laughs> My kids vetoed flower power, which... Oh, no. I know, whatever. So the... <laughs> So I want to start, I'm going to actually look at two kind of two different objects from two different parts of the this Indian subcontinent. And mm -hmm. the first one is, I'm showing you a map of where we are. This is in, um, we're, we're going to be in the 15th century. We're going to be looking mm -hmm. at um, a manuscript of actually a scroll painting that was produced in 1451 under Sultanate rule in the Western, in, in, in Western India, really what is now Gujarat. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and this is a detail of the scroll painting. The scroll painting is actually in the Freer Sackler collection um, and is almost always on view. So if, you, if the museums ever open up again, or we're ever allowed to go back outside, <laughs> we can all see these in our national collection. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty fascinating object. It's over 36 feet long, and it has about 84 verses that are written in three different texts. So we have texts in Sanskrit, in Prakrit, and then in mm. Old Gujarati. Um, and the name of this scroll painting is Vasanta Vilasa, which is, um, Joanna Williams used to translate it as just the poem of spring, you know, sort of a poem on spring. Um, but I think we can also, other people have translated it as Spring diversions, or mm. ways to think of it. Um, but the whole point is, you know, the sort of the main focal point of this painting is, and, and the text as well as the image, is to kind of evoke the mood of springtime. And when you were talking about um, spring as this time of regeneration, of mating, of sexual activities, and um, that's very much a lot of the themes that come out of 
the poetry and and certainly of the images which we will look at um a lot of the the poetry references kama the god of love um mm -hmm. and his desire to sort of spark passion in people's hearts so that they can you know get it on and do what they're supposed to do in the springtime um so the reason um i wanted to just i'm going to show you details of this section of the painting here um and mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things I love about this painting. It's kind of classic Western Indian style painting of the 15th century. So the sort of early period Western Indian painting where you have, um, in this case, this sort of idealized female beauty who's lounging on a, a, a charpoy, on a bed. Um, mm -hmm. And we see there's bolster pillows behind her and there's some fab, you know, fabric underneath her and she's got it looks like an attendant who's bringing her something she's reaching out with a sort of long lovely hand um she is that second protruding eye which is very typical of western mm. indian painting and you see this kind of style in other western indian paintings of the jain tradition jain manuscripts um the kalpa sutra and the kalakacharya kata but this um this is of a different uh slightly different uh, focus um but we you know so we've got this this wonderful we've got she's adorned beautifully look at those fabulous um circular earrings she has in her ears mm -hmm. and the necklaces that sort of drape down between her breasts and then all of the pattern that's happening in terms of the garments very stylized garments that they're wearing um but but pretty fantastic um and so we certainly have references to flowers maybe in the stylized fabric themselves um and then we have um depict you know references to flowers in the text also um mm -hmm. talking about um the 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 jasmine that's um that's draped around her that's sort of in her braid um you're it, i can't see the text actually entirely because your video is blocking it but you know this lovely young woman delicate of, of figure kindler of desire um with blossoming jasmine, right, borne down by her high full breast. Um, what is there in the world that she does not bring under her spell, right? Mm -hmm. um, this other, you know, so there's there are wonderful references to blossoming jasmines, blossoming flowers that are supposed to evoke the mood of spring, um, in addition to the love that Kama or um, Ananga is, um, is inspiring in everyone's heart, right? There with her face, she shakes the will of ascetics as though Ananga or Kama, this is the God of love, were driving his chariot. The circles of her earrings, brilliant as suns, seem to have become the wheels of his chariot. This is, I'm taking here, these are actually um, Norman Brown, Professor Norman Brown had done a wonderful translation of this sort of line by line translation. I'm showing you sort of bits and pieces um, mm -hmm. that I've pulled from the text. So not explicitly the text that is adjacent to this particular painting, um, mm -hmm. but ones that I think kind of, um, that we can connect with it sort of visually and, and are evoked here, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I love, again, as a textile geek, is if you look at the patterns that are referenced in this woman in her like if we go back here to her blouse um or to this wonderful um sort of stylized very angular um skirt that she's wearing and this flying scarf it looks like a kind of kind of like a dupatta but it's a, the quality of the painting it's hard to know exactly what she is wearing um but if we look at um, fragments of textiles, uh, mordant printed and painted textiles on cotton that were produced in the same region around the same period. They're, they've been uh, carbon dated to between the 9th and the 15th century. Mm -hmm. And these were then found in an archaeological site in Fustat in Egypt. Um, we, if you look at these wonderful fragments, many of which are at the Eshmolean Museum um, mm -hmm. in the UK, we have some at the Textile Museum in UK, and they're sort of interspersed in other collections. Um, you can see some of the same patterns that we see depicted um, in these garments, right? In the, in the clothing that these women are wearing, um, we see these also in these fragments. This is also why I think there's, we've got some stylized flowers at play mm -hmm. in addition to the references to, the, to jasmine and, and the flowers of spring. Um, so those are, it's sort of fun to, to kind of find those and think about them. Um, and then if we look at the sort of other side of, of this one little section that I'm showing you here with uh, this, this lovely little, little animal, little deer, I think. 
hard to know exactly, but it looks like a, a little dough to me. Um, and then this is the world's most enormous bee, that big mm -hmm. black bee <laughs> that's yeah. flying above his head. Um, and these wonderful stylized trees with flowers. Um, and then similarly, um, when you were talking about how the empress is, is sort of, uh, is giving the emperor this painting to say, hey, I'm still, I'm still young, I'm mm -hmm. still fecund, I'm still attractive, I'm still um, available, right? I am this right. sort of the opening up of the flower. Then we right. can take lines like this one um, that similarly, um, oops, um, that talk about how the bee, right, is, um, is going from flower to flower. And one, you know, this one that's saying, you know, basically, you know, why are you bothering with this virginal flower, this this jasmine that's not quite yet bloomed, right? And mm -hmm. it's a pun to menstruation, right? Saying, mm -hmm. don't bother with these prepubescent um, young things, right? Let's let's. Um, why don't you just wait on those, right? They're not ready yet. These flowers aren't aren't ready yet. Um, the love is still in the bud. Or this other line that I love that's that I love to think about in relationship to this image. On one mm -hmm. branch of the bakula tree are two vikakila vines without difference, right? Oh be you simpleton, why die of indecision? Enjoy them both, right? So there's also the this um, this uh, wonderful call to enjoy spring in in uh -huh. many different ways, both as a bee and and perhaps in in other ways. Um, so that you know um, this theme of flowers and also of of love in spring. Mm leads me to another image or another object that I wanted to look at, which is in a different part of the subcontinent from um, the Himalayas, from the Himachal Pradesh, now Himachal Pradesh region, the Pahari Hill region. Um, and that is this wonderful rumal um, that is currently in the Victorian Albert Museum. And we have these, um, you know, we have these, they, are, you know, translate rumal as handkerchief, but these, there's no way this is used as a handkerchief. This is a, is a, a covering, an embroidered, this is cotton fabric embroidered with silk thread and a satin stitch silk, um, sort of a satin stitch um, embroidery stitch technique. And these would be covered over objects, either offerings or gifts. So these were sort of um, special objects, uh, certainly not a handkerchief that you would use to like, you know, blow your nose or something. Um, but this one's dated to 1880, um, and it's we have pretty good provenance for this particular rumal. We don't always for many others that exist because this one was collected by Casper Porter and Clark um, in 1882 when he was acquiring things in India for um, the big 1886 colonial and Indian exhibition that happened in London. Um, so we have pretty good sort of details on that. Um, but what I love about this is the pretty classic Rust Lila theme um, that we see in, in a lot of Ramals and also in a lot of paintings of the Pahari region and other parts of, of India. Um, and we can see the, the story is with the Rust Lila is that the gopis, the milkmaids, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hang around Krishna, they're dancing together with Krishna and Either we can we can see the multiple Krishnas as Krishna replicating himself, so there's one for each gopi, or that each gopi is imagining that when she's dancing with Krishna, she's it's just you know Krishna and that one gopi. It's just the two of them. Um, there's a kind of <coughs> devotion and love between the two of them, divine love between the two of them, um, in this um, in this sort of divine play or dance that they have, this Ras Lila. And what I love about this, you know, we've got the flowers are just all over the place, right? We've got these wonderful flowers that are surrounding the central dancing figures. Mm -hmm. um, and then those wonderful floral tendrils, which are so classic of, of Pahari Rumals or Chamba Rumals. Um, and then we have these musicians who are mm -hmm. playing um, you know, we've got one guy playing a doll or a drum, and then um, Shenai, two Shenai players, it looks like, um, and then one uh, one guy playing the the cymbals, the manjira. Um, so we have musicians who are performing for these, um, for our divine dance um, here. 
Um, and then this is actually a detail of another rumal that's actually in the textile museum, not this exact one, but I wanted to show you the stitches so you can see that really lovely satin stitch and the way in which the stitch has some dimensionality. It has a kind of um, a wonderful soft texture to it, um, but it gives, especially in, in a piece like this where the muslin, the cotton, fabric that that um, plain weave cotton base fabric is so diaphanous it's so worn it almost disappears you get a sense of that even from this this photograph um, but then when you see the stitching the, it really gives it kind of texture and dimensionality and you can also see here in this detail and it's true with the vna piece as well that rust lila piece um, that in addition to the silk thread that the embroiderer has also used cut pieces of metal um, of mm. silver that's now tarnished mm. and looks sort of grayish black um, mm. that's been embroidered here to to give it a little shimmer as well mm. so um, i just have those references for anybody who likes online references. Um, but those are the two images that I wanted to show you and talk about. Um, yeah. oh. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that's great. Those are fun. There's so many, there are so many different directions to go when you talk about flowers. I mean, it's gotta be the same in China too. Mm -hmm. In Indian art, there's just flowers, mm -hmm. flowers everywhere. Um, and lots of references to, to spring. Um, I, I think in both cultures, there's a sort of an extensive use of flowers in, in the decoration, in ornamentations. But I think what is different is that at least what I've seen and what I know about Indian art is that the fresh flowers is so much of everyday life, of so much of sort of worship, right? Uh, which is not to say that's not true in China, but I feel like just so much more ubiquitous that you do see these garlands, you know, on people and on cabs and things like Absolutely. that. It's a much more integrated, I would say, right? Uh, I mean, what, what, do, do you have any thoughts about sort of this sort of almost daily constant integration of real f flowers in sort of everyday life? Well, I mean, I th it, it seems to me this is all, when we look at you know, beautifully adorned, mm -hmm. you know, images of gods or goddesses or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the desire to sort of ornament, this desire for Sringara ornamentation mm -hmm. um, is, you know, beauty is, in, beauty is important not just because it's aesthetically pleasing, but it, because it also completes the body. It makes the body yeah. whole, it protects the body. Yeah. Um, and this is why we have you know, you have these um, images, sculptural images too, that are um, so beautifully adorned and then covered up with fabric and covered up with flowers. So they're, they're, the, the sculpture, the bronze, the stone is already beautifully rendered um, and ornamented. Um, and then further additional Sringara, further ornamentation mm -hmm. added. Um, so I think there's definitely that. I mean, when you talk about the, you know, the daily flower, it's so interesting too. I was thinking of a, a friend of mine, Rupa Trivedi, who has this incredible dye workshop in Mumbai. And one of the things she does is she actually collects the flowers that are donated to mm -hmm either, you know, to, uh, you know, the Sufi Darga, one of the biggest Darga, the shrines in Mumbai, or one of the biggest, uh, she also works in one of the biggest Hindu temples in Mumbai. And she collects all the flowers that have been donated and then are just going to be thrown away eventually to make their way back into the water and dissolve. Um, and she's using them to do contact dyeing. So marigold, oh, roses, yeah. all sorts of things to make these beautiful fabrics. Yeah. yeah. So it's, um, <clears throat> There's also a sense in which these things, at least in the way that Rupa is doing it, that these things exist and they have one role to beautify, to make yeah. us famous, to protect and to complete um, an image, a space, a ritual. But then it also, ha it needs to go back into earth. It needs to be recycled right. and recycled right. away. Um, but, but the way she's, she's sort of intervening in that and making an additional beautiful thing. Right. Um, but yeah. But I think, you know, because I think one of the aspects about flowers is that they're not just beautiful and they're attractive, often with their brilliant colors, but <clears throat> that they have this incredible smell as well. You know, certainly that's true with many in their worship context. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> so I think when they're being represented, at least when they're in paintings, uh, oftentimes, such as the paintings by Ma Yuan and uh, with the calligraphy, uh, I think Empress Yang often sort of would evoke 
those ideas are fragrance and smell in the uh, in the poetry itself. Absolutely. So. To, to, but, but, of, but of course, it's, it's a challenge, right? When you represent flowers, it's not always easy to reproduce the smell of the flower in, in that sense. Well, I mean, the way, I mean, I think you see this with the Visanta Velasa that I showed you. And then I would, you know, another, um, another painting that I was, that I also enjoy looking at that I was thinking about showing is, a, is also connected to um, a poem. Um, mm -hmm. the Tor Panchasica. And again, you have those images where you have, um, you know, floating flower, you know, either you have flowers in a pond, big lotus flowers in a pond, or mm -hmm. you have jasmine flowers that are, that are inside our, the heroine in Champa's braid, sort of floating around her braid to indicate how sweet smelling she is. And mm -hmm. then you even have little jasmine flowers that are floating above the pillow in, mm -hmm. the, in the love chamber, in the bedroom mm -hmm. where she's going to meet her lover. And just the presence of those flowers are to evoke the scent, the beautiful scent mm -hmm. um, that would be pervading that entire space. Um, and then it's talked about in the poetry, but there, the way that it's done in the image, I think is actually, um, is, is different than, yeah. than references to blossoming jasmine or sort of the fragrance of flowers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they also always talked about it, highly metaphorical ways too. I think what is common, not just between India and China, but many other cultures too, is that they are talked about it in these sort of highly metaphorical sort of sense, <clears throat> you know, that uh, is interesting. I think this is sort of, even though the representations, I think, the, or the choices of style, whether it is a more mimetic sort of naturalistic depictions of the flower or a more abstract depiction of a sort of almost patterning, right, is, is, a, is also sort of, and the different choices that the artists make to create these sort of depictions is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And these things do, you know, flowers emerge at springtime. Yeah. So it makes sense that, we, that artists would want to Think about the metaphors of spring, thinking about mm -hmm. the changing of seasons, the rejuvenation, the growth, and mm -hmm. all of that, um, the fecundity that one sings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there's also an element that I, di I didn't really mention because it was not central to the painting that we examined. Mm -hmm. But um, plum blossom, for example, they're usually the first one that emerges from sometimes when there's still snow on the ground. So they're all also sort of seen in addition to fertility, to fertility and uh, love and all of that. They're also a sign or a symbol for uh, uh, resilience, right? Some kind of reborn or renaissance uh, under harsh conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, that was so fun. I yeah. love those images. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited to see more stuff next week. I'm going to learn so much from you. Exciting. Me too. That's very great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>